this morning, even through the song, you can do all things. And there is nothing you cannot do. So even at the outset of our gathering this morning, we come before you declaring that you are truly an awesome and you are a truly a mighty God. And you are working things out on our behalf. And so for everyone that is going through something, for everyone that is trusting you for a miracle, everyone that is trusting you for a divine intervention, we pray today, Lord, that you will begin to bless. We pray that you will break through, that we can do, we understand your scriptures that says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So bless your people today. May the grace of the Lord, may the power of the Lord, may the anointing of the Lord be upon their lives, upon their homes, upon their families, in the mighty name of Jesus. And even, O oh God, this morning in this place, we declare an open heaven over this house, over your people, on those that are joining us online. We pray today, Lord, that you would begin to speak, Lord, and that the heart of the Father will be known to them. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. The book of Matthew chapter 16, verses 13, it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked that his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say you John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, son of, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father which is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. When I looked at this portion of scripture, the one thing that came out to us is that firstly, Simon Peter had to have a revelation of who Christ was. Before you can be given the keys to the kingdom, you have to have a revelation of who Christ is. Without a revelation of Christ, you cannot be entrusted with keys. Amen. And so I pray today that God will begin to open, give you the place where you come to the place of having a revelation of who Christ is. Father, we bless your sons and your daughters today. And even as we gather in this house, we declare today, we say, welcome Holy Spirit into our lives, into this place. Just minister to us, Lord. It is our desire that each one of your sons and daughters will have a revelation of who you are. And when they have a revelation of who you are, Father, that you can begin to trust us with the keys of the kingdom. Bless your people today as we continue. In Jesus' name, amen and amen, amen. Well, welcome to all of you today, amen. We're glad that you are joined with us. Let us just worship God together, amen. God bless. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless this morning. Amen. We come to praise our Father and give Him all the glory. For so all the God of our people, come on. The glory of the first and next to you. It's all about praising Him. For those of you who are next come on, right now. Let's praise Him. We bless you, Lord. We bless you. Come on. You, Lord, we praise Him. Your name.
their presence, oh God, this morning. That we can thank you, Jesus. And we can call you our champion, oh God. That all things are possible with you, Father. Oh, we just honor you right now. Yeah.
right now begin to make a declaration. And the declaration is that when I open up my mouth, yes, miracles start breaking for me. Yes, I have the authority. Yes, when I lift my voice and shout, walls, whatever you are trusting God for, whatever you are trusting God for in your home, in your family, that God says he has given you the authority. So to this morning, I want you to lift your voice. Whatever you trust in God for, you may be trusting God for your, your family, you may be trusting God for your children, you may be trusting God for yourself, you may be trusting God for the education, you may be trusting God for a breakthrough at work or even in the company that you enjoy or in your business. Won't you just open up your mouth and I believe that this, this is the atmosphere as you begin to declare a thing, it will be established. And so today, you speak over your life. I, I declare that as you open up your mouth, miracles are breaking forth. So Lord, we thank you. We praise you. Not for what we see right now. We, we, we declare the things that you have already established in the heavens concerning us. And we declare healings in the name of Jesus that by your strength, our bodies are healed.
Every one of us that is here in the church, both young and old, all of us at some stage in our journey have to answer the question, who is God to you? you got to know and have a revelation of Christ in your life. That means you cannot go on, on the basis that my this is who my this is what we, we go to church because my dad went and my grandparents went and everybody else went. You've got to have a revelation of who Christ is for yourself. Now when you have a revelation of who Christ is for yourself, other people can't influence your relationship with you. You see, unless you have a revelation, if you try to serve Jesus Christ through the experience of your parents, it's limited. Through the relationship of others, it's limited. But when you have an encounter, that means when you know something to be a truth out of your personal experience, nobody can tell you otherwise. Until somebody, until you have a revelation of who Christ is for yourself, you are living your Christian life through vicariously, they say, through somebody else. You're living it through somebody else, and in that, you would never come to the place of full maturity. So Jesus asked the question, and this is a leading question because there's some stuff that is about to unveil. So he's asking the question, okay, uh, I asked who the people said, but you following me, you with me, you, you see the miracles. Now, this is my biggest challenge in the church. My biggest challenge in the church is when those that are closest to you, who should know better, know just as much as those that are distant from you. That means I should hold Annie to a higher responsibility as a result of her relationship with me and her proximity to me. That means she should know better of who I am. She should not know me in the same level that other people know me. People in the community know you in a certain way. People distant from you know you in a certain way. But somebody that is in your house should know you differently. So Jesus is challenging the disciples. He's saying, you're following me for some time now. You with me when the miracles are unveiled. You know what the people say that I am. But who do you say that I am? Now the challenge comes in when we're so close and yet we don't have a revelation. And in that moment something phenomenal happens. The spirit of the Lord comes upon Peter. And Peter says, thou art the Messiah, the son of the living God. He makes a declaration of the damn day, day the only concept that the world had of who the Messiah is, is that, is that it, it's not somebody that has come. The Jewish world believed that the Messiah, was, they were still waiting for him. Even till today, they're still waiting for him. And, and, and when Peter makes this declaration, he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He is making an utterance that the then known world was not ready for. But the Bible says, and, and, and Jesus responded to him and he says, you are blessed. Yeah. Hey, when you get a revelation of God, yes. yeah. God himself yeah. begins to testify on your behalf. Yeah. And he says, you are blessed. Amen. And then he says, you are blessed. And he says, he, 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 this is, uh, this, uh, he says, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. But my father, which is in heaven, it's in a normal conversation. That it's not a Holy Ghost meeting. Yeah. It's not a time of fasting and prayer. It is not an awakening service. It's no, no, no phenomenal thing that is taking place. Jesus in an, a natural conversation asked them, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And in that moment, Peter amongst the twelve is standing in the presence of Jesus. And yet divine revelation is hitting him. Yeah. The other twelve, uh, eleven is around him. Yeah. But they didn't get the revelation. Peter gets a revelation of him. And he says, thou art the Christ. Jesus testifies and says, flesh and blood. And he says, no study. Yeah. Yeah. No education. No cultural teaching. Yeah. Nothing could have prepared you to make this declaration. There's a revelation. There's some things that doesn't come just through reading books and through reading certain things. They come, there's some things that come to us 
by revelation of God. Amen. And there is this dimension that the church has not tapped into, the dimension of understanding the revelation of Christ. Amen. He says, flesh and blood did not reveal. And then Jesus goes on. Now I want you to understand this. God cannot trust you with keys to the kingdom until you have a revelation of him. Yes. Yeah. You hear me? Yeah. God cannot trust you with keys and with authority until you have a relationship with him. Until you come to the place of knowing who he is yes. in your life. That means he's not just master. Yeah. He's yeah. not just savior. He's not just healer. He's not just teacher. He's not just rabbi. But he becomes the Messiah, Amen. the Son of the living God. Because the world was not ready to receive him as that. You see, if you understand him as a good man, and if you understand him as certain things, you're not having a revelation of him. You know about him, you don't know him. When you see him as teacher, you know about him. When you see him as healer, you know about him. But you haven't come to the place where he comes and he manifests himself. So he comes to that place and he begins to say, and then he says, upon this rock I will build my church. Upon this, con uh, this confession of Peter, this confession that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, he says, I will build my church, the church, the ecclesia. Remember I spoke about this on Wednesday, some of you have been listening. The ecclesia is the chosen ones. It's a language that was developed by the Greeks, later, later on mastered by the Romans. And the Romans had what they called the Ecclesia, which was then known as a Senate, right? Like what we have in Parliament and in our political system, we have a Senate. They, they are a set of advisors to the, to the president or to the king, and they are close confidants. That means the king begins to let them know what his intentions are, and they have to practically see the implementation of it. You hear me? The ecclesia, in a political situation, the emperor, the king, the ruler, begins to let those people that are close there know what his heart is, and they have to develop yes. the implementation. Yeah. I'm going to say it one more time. Mm -hmm. the, the king shares his heart yeah. to the ecclesia, and the ecclesia sees how it is be practically implemented on the earth. The king of kings yeah. shares with the ecclesia, the church, yeah. his thoughts. Yeah. But it is the responsibility of the church yes. to begin to implement yeah. his plans yes. and his strategy on the earth. Amen. This is important because right now, much of what our thinking of the church is, is that we, it's a place we come to. Much of our thinking about what the church is, is that it's a place of religious activity. But in order of it, if we see ourselves as decoding the mind of Christ, that's why Paul says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And then he says, God doesn't reveal his mind. That means you don't go to your family. I sit down with my family and I tell them what is in my mind and in my heart. The reason of me sharing with them is not that I don't have anyone else to share it with them, but in order for us to implement certain things that is for our breakthrough and for our peace and that will establish us, I share it with them. Their responsibility is to translate it into action. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our responsibility when we hear the heart and the mind of God is how do we translate it into action? How do, do we say your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? We've got to come to that place where we trust God. Amen? Yes. So he begins to give us keys. Now, I want to just share with us some principles that is attached to the keys. That means knowledge leads to understanding. And the principles behind the keys will, can help us to understand how they work in the kingdom. Amen? Now, there, there, are, several, there are several keys that the Lord gives, and we're going to talk about it. But firstly, the keys represent authority. Right? That means when, you, when you're given keys, the keys basically says you've got authority. It means that if you possess a key to a place, it means you have authority in that place. 
if your if, if your manager or your boss or the owner of the company uh, gives and trusts you with keys to the company, that means he has opened up the, the, the business, closed the business, he's giving you authority to, to do that, to open and to close, but he's also giving you access to it, right? But he's giving you authority and he's saying to you, this authority that I'm giving to you is delegated. That means it now doesn't mean you're the owner of the business. It doesn't make you the manager because you've got the keys. It just gives you the, the authority to, to do something that, and he knows you, he can trust you with it because he's giving to you. Now God in the same way comes to the church and he says, I give you the keys to the kingdom. When God gives you the keys to the kingdom, it means he can trust you yeah. with it. Yeah. And he knows that as you begin to exercise it, it will begin to bring you blessing. Now look, let us look at John chapter 14, verse 12 to 14. He says, I tell you a truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. And he will even do greater than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so the Son of Man may bring to glory the Father you may ask anything in my name and I will do it. Jesus left no doubt that the kingdom was supposed to work for the Ecclesia just as it worked for him. The kingdom of God is supposed to work for the church just as it worked for, for him, for Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, is if, I, if you have faith in me, you can do what I do. Not only does he want you to do what he does, but he says, greater than this shall we do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But he comes in and he gives the secret. He gives one of the most predominant and he gives one of the most significant keys in the scripture. He says to them, he gives them the key of prayer. He says, you ask whatever in my name. That's why he said, in the name of Jesus. Yeah. When we ask in the name of Jesus, he says, you, I will do it. That means he's not saying you're asking for selfish reasons. You're not asking out of selfish desire. You're asking according to the will of God, but you're asking in his name. Amen? And it's a wide open promise, and he's saying to you, because I've given you the keys of the kingdom, you can ask what you will, it will be done for you. So understand that one of the keys for your breakthrough is prayer. I can't overemphasize a prayer life and a fasted life. That means there's some things you are trying to work out in yourself. But if you work it out, you're going to be able to only work it out on the basis of your own education, your own ability. But if you ask in the name of Jesus, Amen. And, if you're, and, and, if the, and you're asking according to the will of God, God who knows all things brings into the reality this aspect of the greater wisdom of God and begins to reveal it. So I want you to say, understand the first key that God gives us is the key of prayer. Amen? Now, then also keys represent, or, or, or represent access. That means when I give you keys, it gives you instant access to everything the key opens. That means the secret in, in knowing what the key opens. If I give you a whole bunch of keys, it's of no value to you. Unless you know for which key the, that, that key goes in, which door it goes into, having a whole bunch of keys is, it doesn't make you have too much authority. Because it doesn't matter how much of keys you have, but if you do not know which is the right one, and which is the right door to open keys to the, uh, to, to the kingdom, is that you have to know which keys open which door. The keys to, to the kingdom of heaven gives us immediate access to the resources of heaven. But we have to know how to use them. Because if we don't open and know how to use them, it's going to affect us. Now this is uh, uh, the important. The kingdom mindset completely changes our perspective. It must change the way we begin to see things. Now the second key in, in 2 Kings chapter 16, we, we, we meet Elisha and his servant Gehazi. 
And his servant comes in with a statement and he says, Oh my Lord, what shall we do? And then the prophet answers, he says, Don't be afraid. Those who are with us are far, far more than those that are, against, uh, that are with them. And Elisha prayed, he says, Oh Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. And then the servant's eyes were opened. And he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha, uh, uh, all around Elisha. And as the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike these with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha asked. I want you to understand that when, when, when they begin to work certain things, you've got to understand what key works with situations. What did they need? The key that they needed in this time was a key of sight. That means the, 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 the servant and Elisha are looking at the same situation, but both of them are not seeing the same thing. That means you as the believer, the child of God, and the others that are around you may be looking at the same situation but as a child of God, you should not be seeing it as the world sees it. You should be seeing it differently because you are being informed by heaven what is taking place. That means you're going through the same thing. You have the same job. You have the same company. They're saying they're laying off people. They're saying they're downsizing. They say there's an economic crisis. They're saying sales are low. They're saying it is a difficult market. But in you, you are the child of God, and you know that all things is from God. Yes. He, and, and the Bible says all things is in the hand of God, yes. and He can turn things in our favor. Yes. And the Lord says to us, so in the time of famine. Yes. The world is saying it's not the right time. Yes. It's not the right climate. But God is saying to you, do it yes. this way. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to understand the advantage of sight gives you the, uh, it gives you the advantage over everything else that is happening. Because Elisha is not moved yeah. by the enemy that is around him. Yeah. Because he's seeing the host of, enemy, uh, of, of angels yeah. that is surrounding him. Yeah. So I want you to understand, he knows he has the key of sight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you have the key of sight, you will not be moved by the circumstances that you see. Yeah. Yeah. The problem with many of us is that we seem like the world because our eyes have not been opened to the things of God. So I pray today, like Elisha prayed for Gehazi, yes. God open the eyes. Amen. 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 And the reason your eyes need to be open is that you do not respond yes. like the rest of the world. Yes. Yeah. Amen. When your eyes are open, you begin to see more clearly. That means sometimes the confession out of the mouth of believers is like the world. Yeah. When it should be. When it should be like the children of God. Those that have touched heaven and is about to change her. See, heaven is not changed by circumstances and by situations. Heaven is constant. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. It's forever settled. Your word, O oh Lord, is forever settled in heaven. That means it's not changing. But God is saying to you, I give you the keys of the kingdom. That means you've got an ability to access the heavens, see how God is handling it there, and bring that down onto the earth. As a believer, you should be bringing heaven down into that situation. You go into the boardroom, they're talking about things, and they're saying things are getting difficult. May God give you wisdom. Give you divine insight. God give you the boldness to open up your mouth and, 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 and declare what God is saying. Not just guesswork. But being able to, de to determine and, and, and speak divine truths. This is important. That when you get divine access to sight, you should be able to speak that into the existence. So much so that Elisha is able to say, Lord, strike them with blindness. Yeah. When you have sight, yeah. Yeah, when you have the key of sight, you have control over sight, you can cause blindness to come yes. upon those that have evil intentions. Amen? Mm -hmm. Come on. Yeah. Yeah.
we don't understand it, we may have the key, yeah. but we don't have access to what the key offers us. Yeah. That means if I give you a key to the car, it means yes, you have authority, but if you don't know how to drive the car, yeah. no matter how much of, uh, of access you have to it, yes. it's of no benefit to you. Mm. Amen. I was, I, I was saying in the first service today that, you, you, you know, uh, you, when you have a house and you have a, a, the next key that we're going to talk about is a key that represents ownership. And uh, the possession of the key gives you fact and access of ownership. And whatever the key opens becomes open to you. So Jesus says, whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So whatever you, you got, you got access to open, you now got authority and ownership over. Now remember, how many of you know having your own house is a blessing? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. How many of you know ownership is a blessing? I, and some of you are trusting God for your own homes. Yes. And we pray that God will begin to open that door, yes. that you would have your own home. How many of you know that ownership comes with stewardship? Yes. That means when you rent a house and the light bulb goes out, you know, because sometimes the, the tenants call you because the light bulb went out, right? Or the geezer breaks, or something breaks in the house, what do you do? When you're a tenant, what do you do? You call the landlord. You say, this is your house. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. But every other time, you say, I'm staying here. You just kind of walk in here and everywhere. No, but anyway, when it breaks, you say, your house come and fix it. But when you own the house, what happens? If the geezer breaks, whose responsibility? Yours. If the lights go out, yours. Anything that needs what remember when you take ownership of something, it does not mean that you stop stewarding it. It means there's more work you have to do because it's your investment in it. So I want you to get to that place where you understand that that the key of ownership brings some point of steward stewarding and responsibility. But then keys also represent control. If you possess the key to something, you can control it. When you control it, it means you, when, you when, when, it when you open it, it opens. When you close it, it closes. You can decide who comes in and who goes out. You de decide what comes in and what goes out. So the reality is, when you have the keys, you've got to understand what are you giving access to what you are stewarding and what you are owning and what you're being given authority over. You, this is a very important because the reality is that some of us got keys to access some things, but we are allowing other things to come in and affect Amen. So understand while you've got keys, you've got to understand what you, how to exercise control. Now in 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 12, it, it goes on and it speaks about the account where, where Elijah the prophet comes to the house of the widowed woman. After he was at the brook, the brook dries up. God sends him to the house of the woman at Zarephath and he gets there. We don't even know her name. We call her woman of Zarephath. Zarephath was a town. That wasn't a name. We, we got there and he comes to this house of a widowed woman that is about to make her last meal for her son and herself. And she says, after this, we're going to starve and eventually die. This is what is going to happen. But then he begins to, he sends the prophet to her house and the prophet comes into the house and he says to her, give me something to drink. And that was easy because there was still water available. You see, her problem wasn't water. Her problem was meal and oil. So she comes in and then he says, go make me a bread to eat. And she says, I only have a little flour. He says, make for me first and then for yourself. The key over here is to come to the place where the lady that she was going to learn how to access a key of faith and obedience. But she had control over how this was going to be exercised in a house. The key of faith and control uh, and obedience was going to operate through the principle of control. That means she had control over the situation 
she could have chosen whether to have made a bread or a cake for the prophet or to make for herself first. But if she, she understood in that moment, she had a key in her hand that was going to access a breakthrough that was going to be long term. So she had to exercise the, 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 the key of, of sight to understand I'm thinking for today. If I begin to exercise the word of God from the prophet, the man of God, it could help me for many days. You see, this is where we, we struggle. We struggle in the fact that we know what the key is, but we un, we're unsure when to apply it. This lady was tested in the moment when it was life or death. And she chose life. How did she choose life? She says, I'll make for the prophet first. Amen? Now this is not about manipulation. And the idea behind it wasn't to take care of the, the man of God and to say, no, 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 no. The principle that was there was that there's no hope from tomorrow. And if she just looked at today, she, there would be no tomorrow. Yeah. So I want you to understand that how many times do we make decisions based on today's information? Without the, the, the foresight and without the insight of what God was doing. Yes. Because he knows the end from the beginning and he was about to do something in her life. The widow woman's circumstances changed. Because she accessed the key of faith and obedience, unlocked heaven's wealth and warehouse of blessings, and supernatural provision came to her household and to her that sustained her through a drought. It was over three and a half years that the drought was there. If you think about today, you may not make it for tomorrow. Some of us are violating certain principles in the kingdom. And we're thinking that we are sustaining ourselves. Pastor, you don't know I've got needs, I've got this, I've got that. You seek first the kingdom of God. Be responsible, be faithful to the things that God has given to you. Some of you got no seed in the ground, but you're expecting a harvest. Let me, let me break it down for you. If you're not faithful in your tithes your, uh, and your offerings and your giving, You've got no seed in the ground. Don't expect a harvest. Amen? Get to that place. We're violating a principle and we're locking doors to ourselves. God is saying to us, I want, I want to begin to open this. I want to do this for you. But he comes in and he comes. Are you going to exercise the key of faith and obedience over whatever the circumstances that you're dealing with right now? Because you know, and, and all of us know it, when we violate a principle, we can see the evidence of it in our homes. We can see it in our lives. We can see that certain things are locked to us. Things are not opening to us. And no matter what we're doing, we, we're try, trying to, this thing is like we, we're just pouring, uh, you know, everything, all of our investments into a, wrong, into a wrong thing. God gives us the power. He gets the second, the next key is the power, the keys that represent power. And then the last key is a key that represents freedom. Amen? Mm. Um, you know, the, 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 the reality and, uh, of our country and the reality of many countries like us that are new democracies is that we can have liberty but no freedom. Mm. Yeah. You know that? Yeah. In 1994, we voted in our first democratic country. We have liberty but not freedom. More and more, each and every day, there are laws being passed that is affecting our country. Amen? I want you to know there's a law right now that has been passed right now and, and there's, there's some legal, uh, there's some legislation that has been, that has been developed by our, our government and it's been developed around the fact to control access to information. That means they, they are writing legislation that will control the internet, control, uh, control WhatsApp and, and communication in the country. Be very soon, we can be like a country like China, that no information is, comes in externally, international information comes in, 
without it being filtered by the government. So the government lets you know what you need to do. Every day, our, our rights and privileges are beginning to be diminished day by day by day by day. We have to learn how to pay attention to these things. Yeah. If, we, if we're uninformed, we will have freedom. We, we would have a so-called freedom and democracy, but really no freedom. There are rules also being passed to begin to regulate the rights of, of, of religious behavior to control how churches operate. That's what's being developed right now. And the reality is we think it's just a vote. And we just think it's just a tea. And we get a t-shirt sometimes. Or we get a food pass. Huh? Get our, uh, our burgers cleaned and our parks cleaned and no potholes on the road. But at what cost? Yeah. Slowly be selling our freedom. So the reality is that the keys comes in in understanding this. Jesus comes comes in in, in, in Matthew chapter 8. The, 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 the disciples are on the boat. There's a storm that awakes. Jesus is in the same boat. But, and uh, the, the reality is that they are all experienced, they all have the authority. They all have keys to the kingdom. But Jesus is living a life of freedom. And he's not moved that the boat is in the midst of a storm. The reality is that you will not be moved by the things around you when you get to the place that you're operating in the fullness of all, all that God has for you. So you get to that place. When Jesus gets up, they get up and they say, Master, don't you care? And he says, you are of little faith. Why does he say to them, you are of little faith? He says, you could have handled this. Why are you waking me up? Yeah. Amen? There are some things that God has given you the authority to handle. But you are not handling it. You are waiting for God to handle it for you. When he's saying, I've given you the keys. I've given you the authority. I've given you the ability. I want you to understand there are some things in your life if you violate certain principles, it's going to bring certain strongholds in your life. But if you access certain keys, it's going to bring certain breakthroughs in your life. My challenge to you today is access the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And God will bring the breakthroughs in your life. Let's just bow our heads together in Jesus' name. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. We are so glad that you are King and God of our lives. And so today, Lord, we pray over your sons and daughters that the keys of authority that you've given them. Like we sang the song, you gave us the authority. Like Elisha would say, Lord, strike them with blindness. Like Elijah would lead a, a, a release a word and say to the widowed woman, make for me first and then for your son and yourself. The prophet knew what the woman had in her hand. But he saw that there was more than enough to make for her and for him. And not only for that day, but for the days to come and the years to come. I pray today that you would move your people to a place where they would operate in kingdom authority. A place where they would operate in kingdom freedom. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.